Uh, over the course of my career, I've had uh, the opportunity to meet several biblical translators. Now, I'm not talking about people who study Greek and Hebrew and then translate it to English. Uh, those are some friends of mine, too. I'm talking about people who will go to different parts of the world, uh, like with Wycliffe, and embed themselves into the life of a certain people group because they will have identified a certain people group that they don't have the Bible in their language. And so they will go for years and stay with this people group, get to know their language, get to know their customs so that they can better uh, interpret the scriptures in a way that this particular people group will understand it. And, and when we talk, they'll, they'll, they'll wrinkle up their brow and say, you know, it, it's hard when you try to translate things like grace. How you interpret mercy. How you try to grab hold of a word that is as deep and rich as salvation is and try to help somebody understand that. How do you translate this good news of Jesus Christ to a pagan, unbelieving culture that may not even have the words for it? That's our problem, isn't it? How do you translate the good news of Jesus Christ to a postmodern, pagan, unbelieving culture that literally doesn't even have the words for it anymore? How do you help somebody to understand the good news of Jesus Christ when they don't understand good news of any kind at all? What words do you use? What metaphors? What word pictures do you, do you use? See, this is the same problem that John had talking to his church in the early church. It was one of the issues that he was addressing in the, the book we call 1 John. We're going to read about how he answered this very same question in chapter 3, verse 16. Stand with me in honor of God's word. Now let's read together. Now this is how we have come to know love. That he laid down his life for us. Now we should also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need but shuts off his compassion from him, now how can God's love reside in him? Our little children, we must love in word, we must not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Now this is how we know we are of the truth. Now we are convinced our hearts in his presence, but if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we can receive whatever we ask for him because we are keeping his commands and we are doing what is pleasing in his sight. Now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. Now the one who keeps his command remains in him and Christ he in him. And this is the way that we know that he remains in us from the spirit that he has given us. This is God's word. For God's people, hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Live in us, O oh Lord, that we become the walking definitions the living illustrations of the good news that you are. And we pray this in your name. Amen. It's somewhat of, of a misunderstanding to think that 1 John is a letter. It's, it's not a letter. It doesn't have the things that we would think a letter has, such as it doesn't have a two section. When Paul writes a letter, he'll say, to the saints in Galatia, or to the saints in Rome. And we'll know the, the, the purpose of the letter, the target of the letter, the people who were going to receive the letter. And that will give us some context to understand what is written in the body of the letter. Uh, John doesn't have a two section. He doesn't have uh, an ending and greeting or encouragement section that, that a lot of the letters have. This is a sermon. And one of the reasons we know it's a sermon is that he does certain preacher tricks in the letter. 
uh, things like coming back to the same uh, point again and again, but coming at it at a different way. is as if he's saying to the church, I know you think you heard me, but I'm not sure you got it. So I'm going to say it again to make sure you get it, but I'm going to say it a little differently, and I'm going to give you just a, a little different angle on how you understand it and how you apply it. But I'm going to give you the same point again and again and again. And he keeps circling back to these same handful of points. So if you're not careful, if you're just casually reading, you'll think, oh, I have already seen this. I have already heard this from him. I don't need to pay attention here. That would be a mistake. Because there's some beautiful writing here, and you can almost hear the dialogue going on between John and his congregation about what I'm trying to tell you, what it means, and how you live it out. So he goes and reminds them, this is how we know what we're talking about. Remember, he opened up 1 John by saying, what we have seen and heard, what we know from our life with Jesus Christ, is what we are saying to you. This is how we know that we are telling you the truth. This is how we know that this is the love of God. How do we know? What is it that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us? That's what we know. That's how love is defined. That's how love has been shown to us, that those of us who were not worthy of it, who didn't earn it or deserve it, have been given the incredible gift of Christ's sacrifice in our place. Now, this image of laying down your life for each other becomes the defining illustration, the defining picture of what we know a Christian's love is all about. For instance, it's what Paul figures out and try to, to help us understanding about marriage. The book of Ephesians uh, is uh, Christians in Ephesus writing to Paul and saying, okay, we're Christians, now what? And the book of Ephesians is, now, this is how you live the life that is worthy of the calling that you have. And this is what it means to be Christians in marriage. And the word picture he gives to us is the, is the picture of Christ's love for the church. In that passage, he says, husbands, love your wives. Now, I wanted him to put a period right there. Because that would be almost a Hallmark card, wouldn't it? Paul said, love your wives. But he puts this qualifier on it. He puts this clarifier on it. He, he, he gives us a way to understand it. As Christ loves the church. Uh-oh. Now, the bad thing about that is, is we've already been telling our wives, listen to this man because he's brilliant, because just before that, Paul says, wives, obey your husbands. And see, he, he snookers the husbands really bad in that passage. It's a classic, uh, classic bait and switch. Uh, oh, oh, it is, because, you know, he, he jumps up and says, now, wives, obey your husband. What's every husband doing? Listen to this man. This guy's brilliant. And then, then he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, we've already told our wives this man's brilliant. And you're caught. Now, in all of our discussion about what it is to be marriage and what marriage means and all of that and all our understanding about the husband is the is head of the house and the husband needs to be in charge, why is it that we never have a debate about who this church belongs to? We've never had a discussion about who owns this church. All of us know Jesus owns this church. This is his body. This is his place. He, this is his we don't debate that. Why? Because we've never had anybody love us like Jesus does. And when you think about his death on the cross, that ends all discussion. Nobody comes close to that. That's what we're responding to. And husbands, when you lay down your life for your wife as Christ did for the church, the issue of authority never comes up. She just simply knows there's never been anybody love me like that. So when Paul wanted you to understand what it is to be married, he gave us this picture of a love that gives itself up for the sake of the beloved. This is what we know. This is how we've seen it. And because this is what Jesus lived out for us, this is the way we live it out for each other. In the first chapter of John's gospel, he tells us that the word 
was with God, and the Word was God, it, the, the Logos, the great Logos hymn. The word Logos can be interpreted word or meaning. The meaning was with God. The meaning was God. In, in verse 14 of that same chapter, John tells us that the Word, the meaning, became flesh. The great teaching of the incarnation, that God came into our life. Hebrews tells us that we can approach the throne of grace boldly because we have in our high priest someone who knows what it is to be human, who knows how hard it is so we can approach boldly understanding that we don't have to explain everything to him. He gets it. Because God came in human flesh, everything that he wanted to say is said in the life of Jesus Christ. If you want to know something about the Father, Look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what truth is, look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what is real, what is not, look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what matters and what doesn't, look at Jesus' life. Everything God wants to say is in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why the call to discipleship is come follow, not come know about. The measure of a disciple isn't how much you know, it's how close you are. How close you are walking with Christ. That's the call. What we see in him, what we watch in him, what we have confirmed in his life, we now live out in our life. This is the way that the gospel is translated to a world that doesn't have words to understand what the good news of Jesus Christ is. It's lived out in you and me. We live it out for our brothers and our sisters. We love each other. That's why gossip is so bad. Because when you show up to work or somewhere where unbelievers are and you talk about another Christian, what the unbeliever is saying, wow, that's the way they talk about their friends. If they knew what I am, if they knew what I've done, what in the world would they say about me? I don't need to go there. That's why, that's why it's so bad. Because it hurts the, the witness of the body. We love each other. And we love each other for a couple of reasons. One, we, know we love each other because it's what the Father told us to do. We love each other because the, the, the presence of God is overwhelming us, and we've got to give away some of this love or drown. Okay, we're, we're like a kid that's inherited a, a, a candy store. Okay? We didn't buy any of the candy. It didn't cost us anything. And we've got more candy than we'll ever eat. And so we show up the first day, and what do you do if you're a kid in the candy store? What do you do the first day in the candy store? You eat everything in the store. And if anybody was to walk by, they'd just see your little cheeks all puffed out, little paper crap around, all, all around your feet, you know, and you would eat to what? Till you got sick of it. Till you got sick. Then what do you do? You try to give it away. Here, have some candy. Have some candy. Have some candy. Eat, eat the chocolate. Eat the uh, wine. I can't eat anymore. That's the life of a believer. We have been saturated with the love of Christ. Oh, we can't stand it anymore. We're drowning in it. Here, take some love of God. Why? I, I can't carry anymore. I've had all I can take. I have to love you or drown. I have to give it away because it's overrunning my little life. And that's the way we know. We know because it's the way that we love a brother, because that's not the language of our world. Our language is if you see somebody weak, destroy them. If you see somebody that can't hold on to it, take what they have. That's the language of our world. Yesterday I'm watching the basketball, and this guy makes a great play. It's, a, it's an amazing play. So we got to watch it 48 times in slow motion. And so, you know, they're showing me it. But, but what they really, what they really show is, is that the guy, he slams it. Bam! And he, he's, he's there, and, and he, when he lands on his feet, he stares down the guy that tried to block his shot. He just, just gives him, you know. And the, and the commentators were going, oh, there's a competitor. That, that would have been a technical foul in my day. Okay? When I was, when I was playing ball, oh, I would still be running laps for a first one. But that, oh, you, that's, that's it. You dominate. You own him. That's the language of our world. And what the Christian says to the world is, you can't own me. I've already been bought and paid for. And what you're trying to get is way cheap for what's been offered for me. 
And when somebody walks in and they say, you don't know me, you don't know who I am, you don't know what I've been through, we say, that's right, we don't. But we know something about you you don't know. What? We've been told you bear the image of God. And somewhere under all of that mess, somewhere under all that filth, somewhere under all that guilt and bad decisions is something that reflects to us the very being and nature of God. And if we can help you sweep away from that, we're going to find something incredible and beautiful. We understand, we understand that you are so important and so valuable that Jesus Christ died for you. And that's the great thing about being in a church. We get to walk with somebody, and we get to see those layers of mistakes fall away. We get to watch forgiveness, watch that away. And then all of a sudden, it will break open and be beautiful, and they will say, I never knew. No, the world doesn't know this. It's God and his people who do. You see, if you see somebody in need and you don't help you don't know Jesus. Amen. Now, oh, Mike, that's hard. I didn't write this. I would have written something different. If you're pretty good to people, close enough for me. But that's not. Love seeks the best. I'm going to seek the best for this person. And that's how I know. Now, John gives us an interesting warning about conscience. Be careful of your conscience. Why? We train our conscience. We do. We tell it what to pay attention to, what not to pay attention to, what to warn us about and what not to. Okay? Uh, when Gene and I were first married and we were still in seminary, uh, we had an apartment right next to a train track. Now you're saying, now you're thinking Mike is saying that the apartment was near a train track. No. I'm saying to you that you, pull, you pulled across the train track into the parking place in front of our, dry, our, our apartment, okay? Apartment, parking place, train. Now, the first six months we were in that apartment, we found out why it was so cheap. You can't sleep. And if, and if somehow if the engineer saw the light on your apartment, he wanted to say hi, so he blew his horn. I mean, I mean, dishes would bounce on the table. You'd rattle around, and it's it just, oh, well, after five or six months, it didn't bother us. And our friends would be over, and all of a sudden, they'd jump up and go, what, what is that? What's what? <laughs> that noise. Oh, that's a train. See, we had learned not to pay attention to it. And sometimes you get in a situation, and your conscience will tell you, uh-uh. And you can explain to your conscience, you don't understand. This is not that big a deal. This is not that bad of a problem. I can handle this. After all, it's just one Oreo. Right? I've eaten more Oreos in my history. I didn't do too bad. And you will explain your conscience away. And then you'll end up in a situation where it will fall down on you and you will say, I don't know how I got here. Because you have told your conscience to be quiet. And you have trained your conscience. Now, on the flip side, you can hyper-train your conscience. And Baptists are really good at this. You know, if we're laughing and have a good time, we assume that's sin. <laughs> oh, this can't be God's will. We're having way too much fun. We need to confess something. I don't know. Somebody pray. Somebody do something. We're... <laughs> so, and so we'll get so messed up that we can't even enjoy the good things of life. Because we feel guilty. Oh, this is, I have a friend. He's incredibly gifted. Incredibly. When, when he plays, people stop. People wipe tears from their eyes. It's amazing. And the only one who doesn't love the performance is him. And I go up to him and say, that was amazing. No, no. And then he'll tell me some obscure point. You know, the third bar, the second, yeah, we missed it. And I want to say, yeah, I got that. But, <laughs> but over the years, he's been told it's not good enough. It's never good enough. So he trained his conscience. It's not good enough. It'll never be right. It never, it's never good enough. And so no matter how beautifully he plays, he's never good enough. 
So finally I told him, I said, don't you understand that Jesus gave you this gift for the two of you to enjoy it together? That Jesus is the author of music, the creator of music, and he gave you this so the two of you could talk to each other? <laughs> don't you understand that it's just you and him? And he loves what you play because he loves you. There are times when you do what you do and you do it because it's who you are and it's out of the gift that you have to do that. And in that, somebody will be touched, be transformed, will be thinking a different way about Jesus and his love for them. That's because of the way that you are created. This is how you know you stay connected. Did you see that? Did you see that? This is what we ask. This is how we know you, you, Jesus is Lord and you abide in him. You keep his commandments. And when you keep his commandments, you stay connected to him. Amen. In John 15, Jesus teaches about the vine. You can't do anything if you're disconnected. Now, he didn't say you can't do most things or you'll do badly. He said you can't do anything. And that's why some of you struggle so much for your discipleship because you're trying to do it, do it with your own power. Okay? You've made, it, you've made a New Year's resolution. I'm going to be kinder to people. And that lasted till you got on the interstate. <laughs> and then somebody cut over on you with no blinker and, and you were not moved to pray for him. In fact, you want to be called as a witness on Judgment Day so you can make sure he burns in hell, right? <laughs> this is the guy. Because you couldn't do it in your own strength. But when you stay connected, when you abide, when you stay in worship, when you stay in Bible study, and when your life is aligned, see, that, that's what he says, and you can pray, and you'll get what you ask for when you pray because your life is lined up, and there's nothing to kink that pipe of grace and mercy and love that wants to flow through you. When all that happens because you stay connected. Amen. You abide. You can't do it by yourself. But if Christ is in you, you can't do anything else. This is how we know. This is how you know. This is how we know you know. Because you know that Jesus is Lord. And you love each other. And you can't do either without loving Jesus most.